Hello, welcome to Bethany Church. I'm Pastor Joe. God's grace in God's time. At just the right time, God gave us the gifts we needed, and it's already accomplished. If you look at your life and your day and your history, I'm sure there's moments in time where you can point to things weren't right, things were wrong. Yet God, knowing our history, knowing our background, even knowing our choices, has given us his grace. Can't wait to tell you about it today. Before we get there, Bethany Church is a place about real faith, real life, and real people. We, we believe that our, our relationship with Jesus Christ is the very thing that points us to the hope that we have. And we do it together at our website, bethanyscofield.org. There's all kinds of resources for people to find and navigate their way from where we are right now to where God would desire. The best place he has for us, opportunities and realities are there. Coming this month, the month of December, we have all kinds of special events and activities for children, for youth, for seniors. There's all kinds of things to help people grow in their faith, grow closer to one another, and love God and our world more. We'd love to tell you more about it. Check us out. Send us an email. Maybe we could just pray for you. Those are all opportunities we have in mind. Before we look into this morning's message about God's grace and God's time, Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up this day before you. We thank you so much that you give us your word that points to the truth that we can have. How we can know you, know what you have done, and experience your favor. We can experience your grace. More than any other gift this Christmas, we need you. I pray that we'd be people that would understand and know what you are about, what you're saying. And seek that with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. What is your history? What's your background? Do you know your ancestors? From what I understand, you can do a little swab and you can find from your DNA where you came from. I'm not sure who it was, but someone in my family went way, way back and found out our ancestors. Now, I'm Scandinavian. I'm Swedish. And so they looked back and they found that somewhere we're related to Eric the Red. To around 1000 AD, Eric the Red was an explorer and he made it to Greenland. And he, some people believe he, he established the first permanent uh, Viking settlement there in, in Greenland. He may have gone on and been one of the first ones to the New World, but that's... That's a little debatable. I tell you about Eric the Red because he was famous. He was prestigious. You may have heard of his name. I'm tying my name to something that I want you to think of about me. I'm thinking I, I, I would like you to know about royalty or something like this. I, I tell you those things because you're probably more interested in something you can connect to. I don't tell you about the obscure people. I don't tell you about the other ones. I am purpose tell you the things. And honestly, it's lost to history many times, the obscure ones or the ones that have a bad history. I've got other chapters in my family's history that I'm not proud of. I can tell you stories of bad things that happen. I've got relatives that are in prison. I could tell you about their story. But I don't highlight those. I highlight the good parts. But our history is made of a both, isn't it? Both the good and the bad. When we read the book of Matthew, and we hear the account of how Jesus arrived here on earth, it's fascinating to me the names that are listed. There's the big names, the ones you would expect. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the big, the big heroes of faith. There's David, King David. Solomon, the richest and wisest man that ever lived. There's all these great names. But tucked into that ancestry list, tucked into that list of names, 
are a number of women. We're going to look at four women today who have, because they were women, they would have been looked down upon society. They had un, just bad jobs. They, they were known for bad things. They had a sordid history that is not good. And yet Matthew, on purpose, includes them in the story. The story of Jesus and his arriving is not good advice for what we might do, how to live a better life in three steps or more. No, it's, it's what God's already done. How God has already extended his grace to us. As we look at these four stories, my hope is that you will hear maybe something about God's grace and how it comes to you. It comes to all of us. And that grace is what we all need. This Christmas, we need it always. The verse of the week ties into what that grace looks like. Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. All four of the women we will be looking at today got grace for their time. And I've got great news for you today. That same grace is available to you. The exact same grace we need for our situation is available. Well, before we look into the, the, the message, let's look at Matthew chapter 1. What was he writing? What was he saying? Matthew chapter 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa. There's many other names there. It reads like a Hebrew phone book. All these names, to the Jewish audience of the time, connecting the Messiah all the way back to Abraham was critical because you did not gain status in that society to those people unless you could prove you could connect yourself all the way back to Abraham to King David and then to Abraham that was critical for them so for the Jewish audience that Matthew's writing to that's what they cared about but he includes names that were not necessary for that link he includes the stories of of these women in, in this book, in this story, because while Jesus is the Messiah, while Jesus is connected to the royal lineage, what matters most is what he does for people, the relationship that he has with them and with us. Well, we might just see that list of names. And I'll be honest, many times I see the genealogy list, I, I breeze through them. But I learned some things that I'm discovering some things about this, this particular list that matters. This grace that came at just the right time. First of all, there's grace for a broken world. Now, let me tell you, Genesis 1.27 tells us that every person is made in the image of God. Now, people have messed this up, but God from the very outset has in his mind that every single one of us, every single person, man, woman, boy, girl, no matter what political background, no matter what power structure, no matter what heritage, they're made in the image of God. And so because of that, they all have value, infinite value. However, as people, we don't see it that way. And from the outset, from the very beginning, people have had a hierarchy Let's put people on pedestals and lowered people down. We live in a broken world. And yet God's grace comes to people that live in this broken world. 
In Genesis 38, we read about the story of the first person that we'll be talking about today. In Matthew chapter 1, it mentions Judah and then Tamar, the, the mother of two boys. So why were two included? Why was Tamar? Why are all these, these details were all included to bring the audience back to the history of Tamar. That's in Genesis chapter 38. Tamar was married to a man named Ur. Ur was evil, wicked in God's sight, is what we're told. And so God killed him. Well, the unfortunate thing for Tamar is she lived in a culture that women were looked down upon and they couldn't take care of themselves necessarily. They couldn't financially provide for themselves. So he wrote into his law, because people wouldn't do it on their own, he wrote into their law, into the law, that the next son should have relationship with the 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 wife that lost her husband so that other children could be born because that was their retirement plan. That was the hope that they had. Well, the next son of Judah, Onan, refused to have relationship with Tamar. She was left without children. In that time and age, she would have been destitute. And so Genesis 38, it's a story that's unbelievable. It's, it's it just if if this would happen today it would be it would make all the national news she dressed like a prostitute and went to where judah would see her judah hired her as a prostitute not knowing who she was they ended up having relations she ended up having a baby actually two her two boys and when when judah realized that his daughter-in-law was about um, to have a baby. So before the boys were born, when he realized she was pregnant, he goes, what's the deal? She's an adulterer. I mean, how messed up is that? She, he did the wrong thing, and yet he was going to kill her to fulfill the law. It, it's just wrong. The law has benefit in that it shows what is right and what is wrong. But it doesn't give always what people need. Tamar lived in a broken world. She was looked past. Her husband was wicked. There's so many things that went wrong in her story, and yet God's grace came to her at just the right time. Now, immediately in her time, she was thoughtful enough to save some items of Judah so that she could identify him as the father of the children. Well, that's the first thing she did. So there's grace there, but there's further grace. God saw her situation. God saw the brokenness of the world she lived in and is including her in his ancestry. It's as if he, on purpose, he knows, he saw, he saw what was going on in Tamar's life and not only provided for her in that time, reminds all of us that he is about grace in a broken world. We live in a broken world as well. At any point in time in Tamar's life or ours, we could point to what is wrong. We could take a snapshot of what is going on and say, what is the deal? God, have you ignored us? God, have you not seen? Why is this happening? And there's court cases and relationships with people and our jobs and our children and all these things that are unjust. God sees it. God knows and he gives grace in this broken world. That's great news for us this Christmas. Well, there's more to it. God gives grace for faith. God gives grace for faith. And the next name we're going to look at shows us just how incredible, just a little bit of faith can happen. But we'll also see she, she was maybe driven almost to have the faith that she had. If you read Matthew 1 verse 4, it says, Ram was the father of Aminadab, the father of Nashon, the father of Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now Rahab's story is in Joshua chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 2, we read how the people of Israel have come out of the wilderness and they're going into the promised land. They've crossed the Jordan River and the first city they're going to come on, the first major city, is Jericho. Well, the, all the 
people of, of the Canaanites, the people that lived in, in what would become the Holy Land, are nervous about this. So they throw up the walls. They're not going to let these people in. And the spies, or the, the people of Israel, sent out spies to find out what they could do. And they ended up coming to Jericho and going to Rahab's house for pragmatic reasons. Rahab was a prostitute. So our second story. This is not good, good for Sunday school lessons. It's not brought up on the flannel graphs. But this is what is in the Bible. This is the real picture of Jesus' ancestors. Well, why did they come to Rahab? Well, let's think about it. Because of Rahab's profession, no questions are asked. They could go there and not worry about a lot of questions about why they happen to be in the city. They, they, the, her house was on the wall, so there would have been a quick entrance and escape for these men when they got there. But there's a reason why Rahab would have taken them in as well. I can imagine that she didn't want to be in the situation she's in. Her profession and how she's remembered throughout history is by her title of a prostitute. Even in Hebrews chapter 11, the great Hall of Fame of Faith, her name is mentioned with that title. I can imagine she's ready to move on instead of being known as that. Couldn't she be the child of God, the one who had great faith, she was ready to move on and go into a different place. I can imagine many of us can say, we are that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't have the connections. I don't, I'm the simple something. I don't do this. I don't do that. We have all these lists of things that a person could say, no, that I don't measure up. Rahab was on all of those lists. And yet, by faith, she took the spies in. And she said something. She said something in, in Joshua chapter 2. Remember me when you come to the city. She knew things were about to change. She knew that God's power was real. Now, I'm not sure how much she was a believer at that point, how much she believed in God. But without a doubt, she saw the situation she was in, and it needed to change. Are you in a spot where your situation needs to change? i got great news for you as well. God's grace comes to those who have faith in him. Both right now, he can give peace and strength to get us through our situation right now. But I, I've got great news in that eternity is secure. Because of what happened at the cross, we have the promise of grace and eternity laid out for his people that step out in faith. Well, Rahab is not the only story. We have more. We have another story to look at. There's grace for our mess. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, we're told that Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, Moab, sorry, now Ruth was a Moabite. She was a Canaanite. She was, again, not part of God's chosen people. So we've looked at three names so far. And all three were probably Can not, not Jewish. They all married in. They were all brought into the picture. And the fourth one we'll look at, too, is like that. The story of Matthew shows us this Jesus came not just for the chosen people. He came for everyone. He came for our history. He came for our broken world. He came for those with faith. And he came for those that are in a mess. They're in a hopeless situation, just like Ruth was in. In Ruth, there's a book named for her. In, in Ruth, Ruth 1 through 5, we're told that an Israelite man married a Moabite woman. But then he died. And that would have been Ruth. Ruth lived, but her husband died. And, of course, just like the earlier women we mentioned, that was a hopeless predicament. To not have a man look after you was made life impossible. On top of that, there was a famine going on. So there's nothing to eat. So she's no way of making a living, and there's nothing to eat. There's no way back. If you read at the end of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 4, 13 through 22, 
in just one harvest season, just one harvest season, perhaps September to October, Ruth's situation completely changed. She went from the Moabite with a husband that had died to a husband of the promised people, and eventually she was part of the heritage of Christ. How is this possible? God's grace. God's grace comes to those who find themselves in a mess. In the dark times, we are driven to find a different solution. Think about Ruth for a moment. Her husband died. There's famine. We end up in dark moments, in dark times, where there seems like no way out. But even our wrong choices... The dark times we're in, but even our wrong choices can be can be used by God, who for by by God for the people that believe in Him for our good, for what is necessary. Ruth is in the perfectly wrong place at the perfectly wrong time, and yet because of God's grace, He uses all of those circumstances to drive her. She becomes um, she, she becomes a gleaner. She goes into the harvest field after the harvest is done and keeps the edges, it collects the edges. Through that, she ends up meeting with Boaz. And at night, they have a, a, some kind of a rendezvous. And eventually, she is redeemed by Boaz. She's saved by this, this relative of her mother-in-law. And she ends up getting into this whole new family. Uh, in just one harvest season, her life and trajectory completely changes. God's grace comes in the mess. It's because of the mess she was looking and needed. She had no other option but God's grace. What other option do we have? Outside of God's grace, can we even say we've got control? We can know that we will somehow find a better way? There's too much going against us. If it was just by our strength and our intelligence, our money, our connections, it would fail. So don't rely on those things. Instead, it's as if Matthew's saying, come to me. He on purpose includes just these names to point us back to the history. People left out of the, the top of society. People that didn't have resources. People who have, who have been widows. People who have had no resources. These are the ones that God pours his grace out on. That's what we need. We need that grace. What stands out to me as I read Ruth and I think about her story is her character. She chose to do the right things for the right reason. And God honored that. In an impossibly bad situation, she never gave up on doing what she knew was the right thing. That's our calling as well. Not because everyone is doing it. Not because our world is honoring that. But because we believe that God sees God delivers. That's what we need. Finally, there's grace greater than injustice. If you've noticed through all the stories we've looked at, there's this theme of injustice that runs through it. And absolutely it is there. But also there's this theme of grace. And the grace is greater than the injustice. And it keeps on going in the last name we'll look at today. Bathsheba. Bathsheba had a courageous heritage. Her dad was a mighty man. His name was Eliab. 2 Samuel 11, verse 3. And her husband, and the name that she, the way she's mentioned in Matthew, is Uriah. She's mentioned as Uriah's wife. Uriah and Eliab, her dad and her husband, were both mighty men. We know from other places in the Old Testament, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, that one of David's trusted counselors was Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the one that guided and gave the best advice. Well, all these mighty men would have been friends with David. Her, her grandfather would have known David well. And yet one day, when all the troops went off to war, David stayed back in Jerusalem. He saw Bathsheba on the roof, 
committed adultery with her, and then killed Uriah, killed her husband. What a broken and messed up situation. Now, this is something I didn't realize until, until this week as I studied. Ahithophel, the grandfather, would have seen all that was going on. So when Absalom rebelled against King David, he joined in with Absalom. And I get that. I totally get why Ahithophel would have joined in with Absalom. Even if David's the chosen person, how can you get behind a person that that hurt your family so bad, that, that committed adultery with your granddaughter and killed your grandson? How can, you, how can you possibly support that man? There's no way I could. I couldn't have done that. The story of Uriah, we're, we're told, it's on purpose. Matthew, in chapter 1, says Uriah's wife. It's on purpose, bringing us back to that story, bring us back to that context, and point out the injustice of this world. As great as King David was, and his whole heart for God, he made some bad, bad choices, and people paid a high price for it. There was injustice back then, and there's injustice now. Yet God, in his love and his wisdom, poured out his grace on Uriah's wife, on Bathsheba. It was through her that Solomon was born. It was through her that Christ came. God's grace comes to those living in injustice. Bathsheba needed wisdom and grace in her hopeless situation. How would you respond if you are Bathsheba? How would you possibly know what to say and do? It, it appears that Bathsheba handled her situation with as much wisdom as, as can be imagined. I, how much influence did Solomon's great wisdom come from this woman that strove to do the right thing despite her injustice? And God's grace was poured out on her. When we turn to God in our impossible situations, His grace comes to us and delivers. The very presence of sin reminds us that free will is possible. People choose to go against God's plan all the time. It happened in all four of these women's stories, and it happens to us. Sin is reality, and it is real. This leads to injustice and the hurt and the broken that is going on all around us. And I don't need to remind you, but you know it's out there. You know it's happening in society, in our schools. It's in our families. It's even in our own hearts. We know in our hearts the injustice and the hurt and the sin and all that is broken. Everything in this world points to how this is not right. Can someone tell me it's getting better? Because I don't think it is. And yet it's in these hopeless, desperate situations. That's where God delivers his grace. The genealogy, the Hebrew phone book of Matthew chapter 1, is a statement about how God delivered great news at just the right time. Back then he gave them what they needed to get through the time, but it was always looking forward to this greater thing in the future. He does the same thing today for us. Our Character and our wise choices and our faith now open the door for his grace to come to us right now to make it through. But it points to the greater glory that lies ahead. God's grace comes to us at just the right time. And Christmas is the ultimate example of that. God, knowing our situation, knowing what was lost, knowing how hopeless it is, it gives us hope. It gives us a direction. It gives us something to look to. And it's what we all need. We're just one harvest season away. Just one harvest season away from seeing God do the remarkable. Some next steps for you this week. Some things to consider as you take this word and apply it to life. First, where do you need God's grace for your faults? Where have you fallen short? We need that, don't we? In some level, we're a Rahab. We have made bad choices to put us in the predicament that we're in. Where do you need God's grace? D don't be so proud to admit that you need 
grace for all you have fallen short. That's why Christ came. He came knowing your faults and mine. Invite that grace in. What part of your dark past needs God's grace? You know, the women in this story all had a dark past. Many times, not for their sake, but it happened. Our history and our stories have darkness in them. Christ came to give grace. He came to cover the sin of our past and our broken past and what is wrong. Invite God's grace into that. And finally, where do you need God's grace for your impossible situation? What are you in right now? What are you facing right now? What Bathsheba-sized craziness are you dealing with? Maybe because of somebody's horrible decisions that you need God's grace. He offers it both in wisdom and in peace for right now, but also eternity's sake. This is what we need. I remind you of our verse of the week. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God gives us the grace we need right now, right as we need it. I praise God and thank him for that. With boldness, let us come to the throne. Let's not hesitate. Let's not slow down. Let's come with boldness. Go charge right into that room because our Father is waiting with open arms saying, would you come and speak with me? Would you come and be with me, my, so my child? This Christmas season, this could be the best one ever. Why? Because we are people that come to that throne of grace because there's nowhere else we can turn. God is so good. And at just the right time, we can come to him. That day is today. God bless.